There's there's not one. Oh, what bun is? There's no one really that apple bun. Oh. No, that's Johnny that Appleseed. That is an awesome statue. Paul Bunyan was the big guy from the from the Midwest who had an ox. All hold. They just heard about the guy with the red river paper towel axe. Okay. Here it's like we a big big guy. All right, D.D. Cooper. Oh, cool. All right. So, our start. 1971. A great year, probably. An aircraft was hijacked after leaving Portland. It seemed like it was going to be a normal flight until one man, a Dan Cooper, handed a note to a flight attendant. The flight attendant thought it was just like, oh, this guy's just giving me his number, haha, -ha, whatever, I'll put it in my bag. And then Dan goes, I would look at that note, miss. So she does, and it says, I have a bomb. Sit next to me, and we'll talk. So she sits, and Dan lays out. Dan lays out everything. He says, hey, go tell the pilots I need $2,000 in a no in negotiable American currency, four parachutes, and a fuel truck to fuel up the plane when we get off in um, Seattle. So the flight attendant does so, and um, the pilots basically just said over the intercom, hey, it might take a bit longer than expected. We're experiencing some turbulence. Uh, to make turbulence to make sure no one on the plane felt like threatened or anything because like if people on the plane knew there was a bomb they might not handle it the best so um and these were granted so um and the reason we know his name is dan cooper or that's the alias he gave was because he bought a one-way ticket from portland to seattle um he paid in cash and he used the name dan cooper so that's like the only identification we have because back in the 70s, you could pay for a plane ticket with cash and not show ID or anything. That's probably. Yeah, the good old days, am I right? All right. So the plane landed in Seattle. All the passengers got off unharmed, um, and a flight attendant left as well. And the money and parachute were given to um, DB, and they took off for Mexico City. So it was just the pilots. D.B. Cooper, and I think there was two flight attendants on as well. Um, so they took off for Mexico City, and they, they were flying to Mexico City, you know, making small talk, whatever. Um, and about 20 minutes after the plane, jumped, uh, plane took off, Cooper basically, so airplanes used to be designed, so there was like a, a staircase in the back. And what Cooper did was basically he opened that staircase, and he jumped off with the money. So he used the parachute while the plane was still flying. He just jumped out of the plane. The plane was going slower and was lower to the ground than than most planes are. But it is noteworthy. He was just wearing like a business suit, like like black and white business suit. And it was raining and the wind was like crazy. Um, they've interviewed people. They've interviewed people like the FBI sense, like skydivers. And they're like, yeah, no one in their right mind would would parachute or skydive in that condition, especially wearing just like a, a black suit. Um, so here's the the map taken from the FBI's website. Um, here's the area of Washington where he jumped off. So Portland, Washington. So there was the plane's flight path. That's where they originally thought he landed. But we'll get to this. Some of his money was found there. So people are like, oh. Um, so yeah, so somewhere in this area is where we know he jumped. So this is really interesting. So, um, like I said, he wrote down Dan Cooper, but everyone calls him D.B. Cooper because a news anchor said D.B. Cooper and it kind of just caught, caught on. So D.B. Cooper's kind of like just a, a typo, basically. That's just caught on. So whenever someone talks about Dan Cooper, they're talking about D.B. Cooper or I guess D.B. Cooper, Dan Cooper, etc. Um, and this I thought was interesting. This is a uh, French Canadian comic about uh, a, uh, about like a like a skydiver pilot named Dan Cooper. So the leading theory is he uh, took his name from this comic, which leads a lot of people to believe he is uh, French Canadian. So like Quebec, because um, like we talked about earlier, he asked for two thousand two hundred thousand dollars of negotiable American currency, which no American would say. Um, 
So a lot of people think he he was a foreigner of some sort, but he didn't have an accent either and spoke very good English. So people, um, the leading theory is that he was a uh, uh, French Canadian because that's one of the like uh, only areas in the world where you can speak English and like not have an accent, like not have a very strong accent. And the uh, comic leads people to believe that as well. But like I said, he was wearing uh, a black and white suit, like classic, like all American suit. He was a middle aged man and he carried a briefcase. And um, after he showed the note to the flight attendant, he put on his signature aviators, which I think, you know, where aviators in a plane, you know, just kind of like empower me. Um, and witnesses described him as really polite and calm. They said he was just like a normal guy. And even as like after the bomb stuff, he was just like hanging out. Like he was very calm, very collected. Um, he ordered bourbon and soda. And he even paid his tab at the end of the flight before he jumped out. He like gave the flight attendant money and said, keep the change. So he was like a very like nice guy. Um, he didn't hurt anyone. And he even demanded that the, the crew got uh, like meals when they stopped in Seattle. He was like, make sure you give some meals for the crew because they're going to be flying. Um, and he was even asked by the flight attendants like, hey, do you have a grudge against us or the airlines? And he said, no, I don't have a grudge against you guys. I just have a grudge. So like, in all honesty, he was like a very nice guy. Like he handled this plane hijacking like as best as you could. So you got it. Kind of got to respect him like on that. He's a very polite guy. Um, so like I said, I talked about the negotiable American currency. Um, and he also left his tie. We don't know exactly if it's his tie, but um, based on FBI data, they did like these reasoning experiments and based on like all the people who had ties and all the people who sat in that area, they've deduced that there's like a 90% likelihood that the tie that was left belonged to him. So most people just kind of take their word for it. He was a smoker and drinker, like I talked about the bourbons and soda, but he also left, I think it was eight cigarette butts um, at his seat because at that time you could smoke on planes, which like thinking about now is just insane. Like. I would just, uh, um, and witness descriptions, obviously. So here's the progression of the um, D.B. Cooper sketches. That's the first ever one. And then we have the second draft, the third draft, the fourth. This is like the final. And then that's the age progression. Um, my favorite, I'm a big fan of four or three. Those are like the, the quintessential um, D.B. Cooper sketches. And I really like how subtle the differences are in these. Like. It's it's basically just the hairline. They just made him like the hairline a bit higher. So I just think that's funny, like how minute the differences are. But I guess you'd like see that and stuff. So. Cool. So there's Brian Ingram. Say hi, everyone. Hi, Ingram. Um, so when this guy was uh, eight years old, obviously not eight years old in that picture. Um, he was vacationing with his parents. They were camping. And he just goes to the beach and he finds like $5,000 worth of decaying money that was eventually traced back to um, the hijacking uh, using like serial numbers or all that stuff. So it was Tina Bar on the uh, Columbia River and it's the only physical evidence ever found outside of the aircraft. And there's been like, so besides the stuff on the aircraft and this, that's it. And um, this was a big discovery because it kind of threw a wrench in a lot of the thoughts because um, like uh, that map showed earlier, Tena, Tena Bar is a fair bit away from the original flight path. So um, people had to like change like uh, where he landed. And also another interesting, based on tests done on the money, the money could have only been buried there like one year before it was found in 1980, which the hijacking happened in 71 which is really confusing because it's like, did DB go there and like bury it? Um, there's some theories about it getting washed away by the river. It, it just like threw a bunch of wrenches into things, various wrenches, like a, like a junkie. All the wrenches. Uh -huh. All right. So here there's been like, a, there's been so many suspects for this case. Um, so I'm just going to go over some that I think are really fun. Um, Robert Rackstraw, fan favorite in the D.B. Cooper community. Lots of people love him. 
um, he was a retired pilot who faked his death after killing his wife and uh, using fraudulent checks. So people made that connection and were like, oh, he's a retired pilot. He had a criminal history and like all some other stuff matched up. So Robert Rackstraw was a very popular uh, pick. He died in 2016 and the FBI basically said, no, it's not Robert. Stop calling us. It's not Robert. <laughs> um, Richard McCoy is another uh, very um, known one. Uh, he was an army veteran who had parachuting experience. Making those connections. Um, and in 1972, he committed a copycat hijacking. So he basically did the same thing that D.B. Cooper did a year later. But this guy was stupid, so he got caught and went to prison for it. So a lot of people think he might have been the original D.B. Cooper and then just did another plane hijacking for fun, I guess. Um, but the FBI has debunked that many a times. And then my favorite, Barbara Satin. She was a trans woman and former pilot in World War II um, with parachuting experience. And uh, she claimed herself that she basically uh, dressed up as a man and, uh, and did the plane hijacking and then just lived out the rest of her life. But when she found out that she could actually be prosecuted for the air hijacking uh, claims, she very quickly recanted her, um, her statements, which I think is it's kind of funny. Um, so the modern state, so unfortunately in July 2016, the FBI announced suspension of the investigation, so they're not actively investigating it now, which I know is devastating, um, really hurts. Uh, so that was like 45-ish years, 47, 47 years they investigated the case. And after finding nothing for 47 years, they kind of called it quits. But um, a lot of independent uh, groups still investigate, including Citizen Sleuths. That's a very important one. Um, I actually saw it firsthand because there's a very active D.B. Cooper forum in which people are discussing even to this day, like the case and stuff, which I think is kind of odd. But Citizen Sleuths, um, they're really big. Uh, one of their major contributions is they they got the ties from the FBI and they analyzed it using like photon microscopes and a bunch of other science nerd stuff. Um, and basically they found traces of titanium on the tie, which might not sound like a lot, but in the 70s, titanium was like very exclusive as a material. So their leading theory is that he worked like in a factory with titanium. Um, and he was probably called from Quebec, uh, from French Canada down to the U.S. to work with titanium because he had that skill set and then committed the hijack. So that was so that's an important um, discovery because it like narrowed down the field of suspects substantially. Um, I doubt anything's going to come from it. I don't think this is ever going to be solved, but who knows? Um, and the hunt still continues, like I talked about. Um, the conclusion. Uh, I think D.B. Cooper uh, just lived a normal life. Um, a lot of people think he died, but I do not subscribe to that fact because I think it'd be a lot cooler if he lived. Um, and he just seemed like a nice guy who had some money troubles. Um, no one got hurt, um, and he handled it respectfully. So honestly, I'm I'm team DB. I think he was a good guy. Maybe roped into some bad stuff. Maybe made a couple couple mistakes. So I really hope he's out there, just you know, living happy, living free. Um, the beach money, I got no idea about that. Like I'm just gonna be real. Um, investigators don't have an idea about that. I don't. It doesn't really make sense. Um, yeah, so that is D.B. Cooper. So wouldn't he be about 90-some now? Yes, he, he, yeah. he's either elderly or dead. So. Yeah, this was a great story on the Dan Cooper saga. And the money, yeah, no one knows. Yeah, that's a yeah and there's been, like, various, like, tests to see if those serial bills are, like, mm -hmm. out in the open. Nope. It's like the money just, like, disappeared. So that throws another screwball in there so yeah and there's a really bad movie stuff. and apparently there's a good um documentary on hbo max oh i want to talk about the book in 1973 a guy claiming to be called claiming to be db cooper wrote a book talking about the plane hijacking and he had a contest and 
if you could figure out the riddle hidden in the book, he would give you some of the money he got from the plane hijacking, which obviously was a hoax. And there's nothing that came from it, but I just think that's really funny. Right, good job. Who would like to go next? Okay. Okay. I will find you. Go to Yeah. Yeah. Now we're going. Yeah. I have yours anyway. Yeah, it's on Teams. And I won't be here the rest of the week, so I kind of need to also that today. Still, one does have a rest of the week. Oh, eleven. That's like hard. They're like the best. They're self tough. I'm like so torn on getting a fair. Well, I have the fake one. These are only ten bucks. What? Yeah, just get fake one. Literally, literally. Even though you can sound like you're not. Yeah, get fake ones if you like, and then get the real ones. One hundred fifty bucks is a lot. Yeah. So you look at Walmart. You're Sorry, right, it's, it's loading and loading. There we go. So, one little, one little hint for everybody. Oh, change the lights. Change a little bit. Open up anything. Like, who wants to get the light open? This thing started flashing my eye. So about five or six times on power, I can see the thing flash. Yeah, no, I saw it too. I saw it through. Yes. Uh, and I know, I know, we can hit that button, but if you just have the mouse on the screen and hit the left, it will go. I don't believe you. And you don't believe me? Oh, I'll okay. take a word for your hands. I'm pretty sure I tried that. It doesn't work. Maybe you just like technology needs. You have that would be what you say about science nerds. Yeah. <laughs> they haven't forgot. The science. All right, here we go. I'll list this out. Okay. My history was the death and disappearance of Elisa Lamb. She was a 21 year old student from Canada, um, and she was feeling a little bit stressed and burnt out from school. So she decided to take a solo trip to California and along the West Coast. Um, this was in the summer of 2013. She arrived to LA on January 26th and before taking her trip, her family was pretty nervous about her leaving and going alone. So they have required as kind of a compromise that she would um, contact them every day, like via call or text, just so that they knew she was okay and for updates on her trip. Um, she also was a very avid Tumblr user, so she kind of was keeping a lot of people updated about her trip throughout the entire time that she was on it, um, which was later used in her investigation. What happened? Um, on January 31st, Elisa was scheduled to check out of the place she was staying in LA and head to um, San Antonio, I believe, or no. Oh gosh, I don't remember. Um, well, anyway, she was scheduled to check out and um, her parents didn't hear from her this day on January 31st. So as a precautionary measure, they called the police and on February 1st, she a uh, missing persons report was filed. Um, then on February 19th, af after multiple complaints of the water at the hotel she was staying at, tasting kind of gross and smelling weird, um, they went into the hotel water tanks where they found Eliza's body floating. Um, so, and it was closed on top. Yes. Yeah, there was um, like a lid that you had to lift up to get into it. So, um, when she was missing, the LAPD, uh, they were kind of at a gridlock. They couldn't figure out where she was. There was no evidence leading to it. So, as a last ditch effort, they released this footage. Um, it was a video. It's the last video of Eliza. It's her in the elevator um, at the hotel she was staying. This is the day she most likely went missing. She can be seen in the video. This is just a screen cut from it. The video is pretty long, but you can watch it on YouTube. It's kind of creepy, but she's seen pressing all of the buttons to the um, elevator. She's seen looking at the elevator going like this, walking out, walking back in, pushing all the buttons again. Um, some people think she looks like she's looking for someone. Others think she's just kind of going crazy. Um, but this footage now, I think has 12 million views on YouTube, but it blew up. Like when this footage got released, there was millions of views within a day. Like it, it went so viral, which brought so much attention to this case too, making it kind of like a less almost about finding the victim and more just like a murder mystery for people to follow along with. Um, so another reason this case was so popular is where she was staying. She was staying at the Cecil Hotel, which was notorious for housing different criminals um like killers drug dealers robbers it's kind of people used to stay here if they didn't have enough money to pay rent for their apartment so they would stay here because the rooms were like 
dirt cheap. And this was kind of where you went when you didn't want to be found. Like if that was the kind of unsaid role is also located in Skid Row, which is um, basically where a large part of the homeless population at, in LA resides. Um, and from 2007 to 2017, the manager said she witnessed over 80 deaths in the hotel. And she doesn't believe that there's a room that someone hasn't died in there, which is so eerie. Um, a famous person who has been housed here was the Night Stalker. In the height of his killings, he stayed at the Cecil Hotel, and there's been a few other murders there. Um, it has since been shut down, but at the time of Eliza's stay, it was up and running. So Eliza was had bipolar disorder, which is a neurological disorder where your mood and emotions switch without really much warning. Um, this is probably the most logical explanation for her disappearance. It is said in her toxicology report that she hadn't taken her second antidepressant that day. And she also had not been taking um, her antipsychotic meds. And this is pretty common for bipolar patients to skip on their meds because they like the feeling of up and downs um, kind of as like a high for them. And I think that people kind of assume Eliza wanted that high back, especially traveling alone, she might've been anxious. Um, not taking these medications leads to manic side effects, which would help explain her behavior in said video. Okay, so some theories for why she disappeared. Number one was she missed her medication, went manic, and somehow ended up in a water tank. Another theory, and this is also pretty plausible, um, the water tanks are like 14 feet high and they're closed on top. So for her to be able to get in one is like very surprising and it's really hard to do without setting off the alarm you would need a hotel worker to not set off said alarm um so it's suspected that maybe someone led her there and killed her um it also there's been a few random suspects who have just been accused kind of ruining their lives honestly um there's one guy who his name but he was accused of killing her and he didn't but it totally ruined his life um personally i oh another People also think it could have been some like extraterrestrial or some spirit thing or like a ghost that led her there. I don't really believe that. Um, another just weird coincidence is right down the road, uh, there was a lab that was testing a new drug for TV called that. But <laughs> if you shorten that, it says um, Lamb Eliza. That's the shortened, like condensed abbreviation for that drug, which is just crazy creepy some people chalk that up to a coincidence that's a very big coincidence but um personally i believe she forgot her medication and was going manic as for how she got in the water tank i i don't know i don't think anyone knows this case is kind of just been resolved left up to a mystery very creepy though yeah, videos right? oh it's very yeah it's it's weird she, it's so scary it's like, you're seeing any yeah, probably. probably that's what so. that's what some people think. <laughs> probably. Good job. All right, let's go next. I would advise you not to think about it. <laughs> Calm down. Don't button the next one. I learned to say it. Alright, here we go. All right. Calvin. The Bermuda Triangle. Now, where is it? Um, it's this little triangle region. Um, reach, it's in the Atlantic Ocean between Miami, Puerto Rico, and the island of Bermuda. However, this area is um, not always the same, depending on where you look. Um, it's anywhere from 500,000 square miles to 1.5 million square miles. And it's estimated up like what it is. Sometimes they put it like further north in Florida. Sometimes they like extend it to like over here or like above Bermuda. It's bizarre. The term Bermuda Triangle was coined in 1964 um, before it didn't really have a title. It was just kind of known as like sketchy waters. Um, now the mystery, of course, being that there are hundreds of incidents of mysterious or strange ship or and or air aircraft experiences. Mm -hmm. The thing that makes it weird and mysterious is usually there was, or like the ones that are mysterious are the lack of SOS signals from ships or even planes, and then often the lack of wreckage being found. So we're going to get into um, some of my favorites. Now, also the estimate for like ones that are completely unsolved ranges, but like the commonly agreed upon numbers are 50 ships 
and 20 aircrafts that don't have any explanations. Um, first, this is my personal favorite, the Ellen Austin. This is in 1881. There's a ship bringing a bunch of immigrants from Liverpool to the land of America, you know, trying to make a better life. They're going down, and they see this ship. They, they, have, they get out their binoculars, they look, they look, nobody's on it. And they're like, oh, the ship's in perfectly good condition. This is awesome. So they send half their crew over to the abandoned ship. They get on perfectly fine. They hop on the ship. Then a storm separates them. They're separated for like a day or two. And then they see the ship again. Once they see the ship again, it is completely empty again with no structural damage. It's in perfect tact, just like how it was the first time they saw it. And none of the crew was on there. It was as if there was no life ever on it. And so then they abandoned it because they were like, this is the creepiest thing we've ever seen. We're going to leave this thing be. Then they went back to America. So the ship's still off. Uh, yeah, I mean, it probably <laughs> sank by now, but yes. Um, other famous ship incidents, there's a USS Cyclops. It was a uh, U.S. military ship just going for a, a pretty standard thing. And then last ever transmission from the USS Cyclops was weather fair all well. And then it just went off the radar completely. completely disappeared. And then the witchcraft yacht was just two, two dudes who were uh, just hanging out. They wanted to go walk, look at the Christmas lights off the coast of Miami. And then um, they called the Coast Guard and were like, hey, we hit something, but like, we'll be fine. Just send the Coast Guard over to come pick us up. But like, we'll be fine. We have like a couple hours before we sink. So then like 15, 20 minutes later, the Coast Guard gets there and nothing. It was as if the signal never got sent out at all. Like there was no traces of any ship being there. Um, and then the aircraft flights, um, there's this guy, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. I'm pretty sure it's Rock Ride. Um, yeah, Ryan Yanklowski. He is going to be doing a presentation on Flight 19. It's the most famous of the aircraft disappearances. Um, so keep your eyes out for that. Other than that, we have the Star Tiger and the Douglas DST. Um, these are two of the ones with the highest casualties. Um, and also, I just thought it was interesting to happen in the same year. It's a little bizarre, but pretty much the same thing, just aircrafts that just mysteriously disappeared without warning. Um, as you can see, six crew and 27 passengers on the Star Tiger, and then three crew and 36 on the Douglas TST. Another thing with the Star Tiger, there was another plane that went missing called the Star Aerial. It was like the same build of the plane, um, and it happened two years later. So, like, there's probably an explanation for that of faulty planes, but we'll talk about that later. Um, and then this one is interesting. This one, if you look up Bermuda Triangle Mysteries, this one gets brought up all the time. There were two dudes. They were keepers, the lighthouse keepers, on this island. And this is a very small island, as you can see. This is a picture of the island. And they were doing business as usual, and then they just completely went off radar. So a, radar, so a ship went and checked on them, and they were gone. But a hurricane had ripped through the island like two days late before that. So they probably just died in the hurricane. But every time you look up the... Bermuda Triangle Mystery. This one gets talked about. I think it's lame. I don't know why it gets brought up all the time. Do you know about the games that should start with? No. Was it not Robert Pattinson? It was not Robert Pattinson. It was not Robert Pattinson. Oh, theories. Uh, a lot of people think it's mysterious sea creatures. Uh, the ancient ones. So there's the Kraken, Artist Rendition here. Um, or the Megalodon, giant sharks, or other creepy... Ocean monsters. Um, another another fun theory is that Bermuda is actually the location of Atlantis, um, and so water magic and stuff. That's why ships mysteriously disappear because of water. Um, alien abductions is another one, and then for planes, a lot of people think wormholes and you like teleport out of space. Um, now, yeah, cracking. Now let's talk about some more legitimate uh, theories. Let's talk about the scientific ones. Um, there's this thing called the ag agonic line. I didn't know this, but compasses overcompensate what north is. Like, true north and what compasses tell you is north isn't, like, exactly the same. So they have to, like, compensate to point truly north. But when the agonic line lines up, it's, like, they're the same. So compasses start overestimating where north is because that throws pilots all out of whack because um, their compasses are reading the wrong information to them. And then that coupled with uh, human error can lead to crashes. Um, rogue waves is another one. It's when storms from the north and storms from the south kind of meet together and create like these massive waves. Um, and people think that sometimes a like 
crew will think, oh, we're just, we see this storm, it'll be fine. They go into it, and then a rogue wave catches them off guard, and they sink like that. Um, hence why those SOS signals. And then this is my personal favorite, methane bubbles. This is cool. So sometimes the Earth will open up, and it'll release a bunch of methane gas. And if the, once the gas reaches to the surface, as you can see here, it's frozen. But once the methane gas reaches to the surface, it reduces the buoyancy at where it hits the surface of the water. Meaning if a ship floats over methane gas as it reaches the surface, the ship will just sink like straight away with like out any warning, like seconds, it just dips underwater and it'll come back up. But the thing is when the ship is fully submerged, it's done. It's not popping back up. Um, and scientists are like, tend to lean more towards this for like sudden ship disappearances because you can test it with just like things like rocks or like not rocks because rocks immediately <laughs> sink, but balls. If you test it with like a ball that could float and you release a bunch of bubbles into the water, it'll sink. And then once the bubbles go away, it comes back up. So if a ship goes over and back, gas sinks and then it's done. Um, and then as for aircrafts, most of that can be um, attributed to human error. This was a plane they found like that was discovered, thankfully. Um, vertigo happens a lot to pilots being in the air for too long. And also the Bermuda like waters is a tough place where the horizon line is really hard to see. The water oftentimes is the same color as the sky. And the horizon line is what pi pilots go off of primarily to tell what to like locate themselves in the world. And since it's the same color, it can get really trippy and hard to tell like where they are. So when you get vertigo, you'll like think you're turning right. Your brain's telling you you're turning right but your compass is telling you you're turning left because you are turning left. And so then you'll overcompensate and turn right and then the ship or the plane then go out of control, crash. Um, and then like I said, flying is very mentally straining. So, you know, people, and then also just humans sometimes don't wanna call in for help. That's why lack of SOS signals. Um, conclusion, I'm personally a big methane bubble believer. I think that's a really interesting and plausible explanation for ship disappearances. Um, I also maybe think that's the reason for the Ellen Austin. Maybe it dunked underwater just long enough for the crew to fall off, but the ship wouldn't take any damage. I don't know, I like that theory. Um, but then also just uh, that it's probably just a lot of human error and various storms and things. And then also what I found is the Bermuda Triangle ultimately is not any more dangerous than anything else. Um, it's one of the safest like proportionally uh, trade routes in the world. There are ships that go through the Bermuda Triangle constantly and wrecks don't happen that often. So it's really not like, it's really over-exaggerated in terms of its infamacy. So, so it's kind of me. Uh, yeah, more or less. <laughs> you know, Columbus had trouble with costs. Everyone, yeah, that's, that, that's a big deal. Any questions? Yeah, I remember, lot, once again, lots of bad movies about this. <laughs> lots of bad movies. All right, so we better hear about Flight 19. Good job. What do you think, Brady? I think the, the people of the Ellen, like, they didn't allow folks in the winter, so, like, those people, they were allowed to move so they went into their country. That is a good uh, story. I see. Yeah. So the Ellen Oss was probably a pretty good one, I would pick. For the quiz. All right, here we go. Flight 19. Is the title? Not on here either. Huh? Cosmos. Yeah. Yeah. Just like yeah. Flight 19. Wait a second. It's a mystery. I think that means we get to make up our own title. It's like Death of the Author. Like everyone gets to make their own title. Uh, no, it's not here at all. Are the rest of the slides uh, gone? Mr. Partridge, just yeah, you're at least gone. Look, I'm going to go to the next place. It's going to lie. It's all on the screen. Yeah, there is. That's so. Must be aliens. All right. Once again, aliens. All right, here we go. Okay. Cited flight 19. Uh, so before we go on to flight 19, I want to talk a little bit about Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor. Uh, the reason for this is he was the person kind of leading flight 19, which was made up of five different uh, TBM Avenger torpedo planes. Uh, but Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor, 
was a veteran in the World War II uh, Pacific Theater. Uh, after World War II, he was a flight instructor uh, for not very long. Uh, flight 19 occurred on December 5th, 1945. It's not long after the end of World War II in uh, the Pacific Theater. But he had over 2,500 flight hours, uh, and a lot of that in very intense situations, that sort of thing. So he's a very experienced flyer. Uh, now, as for the beginning of the flight, uh, it was just a routine uh, bombing training, uh, uh, practice bombing training. It was called, I believe, uh, Navigation Problem Number One, uh, it was the exercise's name. And basically, they would start in Fort Lauderdale, go to the east, uh, drop some practice bombs, and then make their way back to Fort, Fort Lauderdale. Uh, multiple flights had occurred that day, 18. Uh, this was the 19th flight, uh, therefore the reason for it, the name. Uh, and everything was going well with Flight 19 to begin with. It was a clear day, uh, no real issues to begin with. Uh, the only thing that was noteworthy, uh, Charles C. Taylor had uh, arrived late to the free exercise uh, briefing and then had asked to not fly that day. Now, the team started going south after successfully uh, dropping their practice bombs. Uh, Charles C. Taylor uh, begins to think that his compasses are wrong uh, and starts uh, to basically radio into the rest of the uh, planes that he believes they've gone too far south. Instead of going east, they've gone into the Florida Keys, uh, which are south of Florida, kind of near the Gulf of Mexico area. Uh, then on top of that, to make things worse, the weather started getting really cloudy uh, and it became just a lot harder to be able to tell where they were just by looking. Uh, we know Taylor thought he was in the Keys because of radio communications that the Navy picked up, uh, where he had radioed in to uh, Robert F. Cox, I believe was the first one who heard him. And in that situation, uh, he had asked Taylor if everything was going all right, and Taylor had radioed back that he wasn't quite sure where they were, but he knew he was in the Keys, is what he said. Uh, now, after a little bit, uh, let me get past, but actually, after a little bit, they ended up disappearing, uh, and uh, they lost all communication with uh, Taylor's crew. Uh, and so the Navy sent out uh, some search planes, uh, two of which were PBM Mariner flying boat planes. Uh, however, things started going wrong here uh, when one of the PBM Mariner flying boats disappeared, uh, just like uh, Flight 19 had, uh, and it had 13 crew on board. And so it disappeared. They weren't quite sure what went wrong at first. Uh, and next they sent over 300 boats and planes to search for both. Uh, that being said, they did figure out the Mariner. Uh, what they uh, figured out is that it most likely exploded uh, in the air. Uh, and these ships had a kind of record of exploding in the air. They were nicknamed flying gas tanks. Uh, and on top of that, to confirm reports, there was a merchant ship uh, near the area that later reported seeing a fireball in the air. Uh, around that time. Uh, so that pretty much all but confirmed the uh, theory of it exploding. Uh, now, as for kind of the outcome of Flight 19 and uh, just the mystery of it, uh, Flight 19 was never found. Uh, they were able to go back through communications they were able to pick up between Taylor and the rest of the planes to figure out that Taylor had started leading uh, the rest of the crew northeast, uh, which is kind of against regular Navy protocol. Usually you're supposed to fly west if you believe you're lost, because eventually you'll find land. Uh, however, Taylor, thinking that he was in the Florida Keys and Gulf Mexico area, uh, flew northeast, thinking that eventually they'd find Florida. Uh, the last communication they picked up with Taylor uh, was him telling all the planes to land in the ocean. Uh, because one of the planes had run out of fuel. Uh, and so they're all going to land together. Uh, the uh, this other 
mysterious part of it, though, was that there was no SOS signals ever released by Taylor or any of the other planes. However, uh, most likely this was just due to Taylor uh, deciding that they didn't need to. Uh, once again, as Aiden kind of talked about, a lot of times humans will refuse to ask for help. Uh, that's a common thing. And so most likely he just never did. And since he was the leader of it, that's why most likely the other four planes didn't uh, release it either. Uh, after the disappearance, uh, Lieutenant Charles Taylor was charged guilty with mental aberration. Uh, however, he was later exonerated uh, after his mother was fighting hard to get rid of that. So as for the reaction to uh, Flight 19, there was a lot of theories that started coming up about it. Uh, one of the most popular ones was aliens. Uh, and this was especially popularized uh, during the 1970s uh, with movies like The Third, or Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and there's a couple other films released about Flight 19, and this was also during the UFO panic. That caused a lot of people to start believing that aliens were somehow involved with it. Uh, the other thing about Flight 19 is it was one of the first mysteries that really started popularizing the Bermuda, Bermuda, Bermuda Triangle. Uh, and yeah, it was just one that a lot of people started thinking that for whatever reason it had to be otherworldly uh, forces that caused it to go missing. Uh, I don't know why I put an animation, but uh, it was mysterious. It uh, what actually happened, uh, we don't know for sure. However, most likely. Uh, Taylor was just not fit to be flying that day. Uh, once again, before even arriving, he was late and requested not to fly. So for whatever reason, he obviously did not think that he was fit to be flying. Uh, and once he did, most likely just for whatever reason, wasn't in the right state of mind and got lost and made some really bad decisions. Uh, but the main thing about it is that once again, it was never ever never found uh, none of the planes. And because of that, it spawned a lot of kind of crazy reactions and theories. All right, good job. Have a good one. It's no coincidence that it was 45 that happened. Two years later, is when the first real flying saw the trails. Two years later, that fit right in. Has anyone seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind? It's a very good movie. Yeah. And I would highly it's recommend it. The Devil's Fall. Yeah, Devil's Dollar. All right, so let's do it right now. It's so going to have time to do another presentation. Let's pick some myths. Let's pick some myths. I'm trying to talk to you. Yeah. There's some good ones. Not as good as mine. Doing John Henry. What did you do? He did. Uh, uh, don't need to record this. Oh, she turned.